Welcome to Musicians vs. the World, the podcast where we explore aspects of music and musician life that may not have been covered in music school. I'm your host, Christine Smith, and today we are talking about injuries. And I know we've discussed this before with other, with other guests and some personal stories, but I can't express how important this topic is for musicians. Injuries can affect us through, they can affect our careers, our physical health, our mental health. And so it's really important that we continue to have these conversations and bring awareness to injuries and learn how not only to live with them, but to prevent them and keep our careers going as long as possible. So in light of that, I have brought an expert to talk with me and to talk with us today about injuries. And so with me is Dr. Kensley Beal. Ken, so Dr. Kensley Beal is a classically trained clarinetist and researcher in the field of performing arts health. Dr. Beal also works as a freelance journalist to cover men's gymnastics in Germany, Scotland, the U.S., Canada, and Japan. It is through these multidisciplinary experiences that she works to create a more health-aware mindset within her own community to prevent injuries. Dr. Beal has presented at the American Speech Language Hearing Association, the Performing Arts Medical Association, and the International Clarinet Association, among others. And she also works as a life coach and advocates for whole person care, including one full day of rest each week. So Dr. Beal, thank you so much for being here and welcome to Musicians vs. the World. Thank you so much for having me. I have been a fan of the podcast for some time and, and love how you investigate these other aspects of being a musician. And I'm, I'm happy to share a small portion about musicians injury and prevention today. Oh, I'm so, I'm so pleased that you, well, thanks for liking the podcast first off, but I'm so, so glad to have you. I'm just, you have such a wonderful outlook and such an interesting perspective from your story. And I, before we jump into injury, I want to talk about your story. I am just so impressed with how you took something that could be damaging and career ending and you've created that to launch research to help other musicians and I applaud you for that. Um, would you mind telling me all about your story and how you got to where you are? Not at all. Um, so I won my solo debut as a clarinetist when I was 18 and I got to perform with the Jacksonville Symphony Orchestra. and. I just, I remember standing on that stage thinking without a shadow of a doubt that I was going to be a professional clarinetist for the rest of my life and nothing was going to stand in my way. And then as I got really into my undergraduate years and you start increasing your practice time, I started developing this nasal leak and nasal grunting called stress velopharyngeal insufficiency, which is just this really obnoxious mouthful that means that my soft palate or my mouth didn't work as it should have. And there's a couple of reasons for this. For some people, it could be because they're over-practicing or because they have an audition coming up and so they ramped up too quickly um, without having proper warm-up. Um, but for me, I actually had two literal holes in my soft palate that required surgery. And I'll never forget, it was maybe like a month or two before I was scheduled to have this surgery. And I was meeting with a clarinet, a very, very well-respected clarinetist in the field. And they heard my nasal air leak. And they told me, you just need to use your air better. And I said, well, you know, actually I have these, these two holes in my soft palate that I'm getting surgery on in a couple of months. You know, this is actually physical, it's anatomical. And they told me, uh, no, you just need to use your air better. Oh, no. And, and I, I will never forget that moment because that has really been the impetus for why I've wanted to create a more healthy and informed and aware music educator population. Because if I had not had that information, if I didn't know that I had this anatomical problem, I probably would have believed them. And that really mm -hmm. could have ended my career. And I don't think that this person was like malintentioned. I think that they were just under informed. So my question is, how did you notice you? So you heard something or did you feel something? Uh, so both. So I had air leaking out of my nose, like physically leaking out. I had this crazy oh. grunting sound. Um, it was really painful to play. And 
as a result of having the air leak out, it was actually affecting my vocal cords and I was having this weakness in my voice and really wasn't able to talk as well as I wanted to. Oh, so it was like, it was affecting everything. It was affecting everything, my quality of life, my ability to tongue fast. So if you're a wind player, you know, you have to use your breath and your air really efficiently to be able to tongue fast passages. Well, half of mine was escaping out of my nose. So like that was a whole other problem. Like forget Mendelssohn scared. So there was no way that was happening. Um, And so I, you know, I went and I had this surgery and then I had this other complication where I came out of surgery with a British accent. What? Wait, what? Yeah. So the my soft palate, the scar tissue was so severe that I couldn't produce what's called a post vocalic R, which means any R following a vowel. So if you use the word like jar, so J A R, I couldn't produce that R after the A. And so I sounded British, which was both very cool and very confusing because people who know yes. me my whole life are like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> Um, wow. So, so did that, that was that something that had to be, you know, with physical therapy or? Uh, so we use speech therapy for them okay. to work on lengthening back out the pharyngeal wall so that I could produce an R and sound like an American again. That is crazy. Now, so did you always have those holes in your soft palate and it just finally, you finally noticed when you're practicing ramped up? Yes, I always had it. It was a uh, cleft palate runs in my family. So if that's the when you're missing part of the front of your mouth. But mine just happened to be inside of my mouth. And when you speak, there's a certain amount of pressure that happens in your mouth. It's called intraoral pressure. But when you play an instrument, it's been measured up to 30 times greater. So if you have that anatomical problem, for you, it may not occur during speech, but when you put more pressure in there, it, it just expands and it collapses under that, under that high pressure. Wow. Well, that's so impressive that you were able to get that fixed and then not only finish your undergrad, but then you went on and got a graduate degree in performance as well was how that must've been difficult with recovery and, and ramping back up your practicing. It was, it was hard. So the surgery happened at the very end of my sophomore year my junior year, I was given an exemption uh, for my scholarship and had was able to not have to enroll in ensembles and was just able to take that time to heal. So I'm so thankful to Florida State University for their um, their willingness to work with me and recover from this very, very strange injury. And then I was able to uh, audition for a couple of degrees and then ended up choosing the University of Michigan for my master's. Um, And there I got a little bit more insight into musicians' health problems, uh, but more from an athletic perspective. Oh, yeah. So now tell me about this, because you're you're also a journalist for gymnastics. And I am so intrigued with how, from an athletic and musician aspect, they kind of, because they are very similar when it comes to injuries. So what's your experience with that? Sure. Uh, so in the fall of my first semester, my master's, um, I was cleaning the dishes and a glass dish broke on my hand. So I wasn't actually able to practice or play in some of the concerts. Oh, um, no. So I had this, I know it was, it was kind of a freak accident, but I had this free time on my hand and I thought, well, like I want to do something. And I looked to see what the student jobs were available and ended up reaching out to the men's gymnastics uh, coach because they had an Olympian on the team and I really wanted to meet an Olympian. I thought that was really cool. So (laughs) um, I, they said, you know, we don't have any volunteer positions open, but we have, you know, this ability for you to run the men's gymnastics floor. I was like, sure, I can do that. Never had I ever been on a competition floor, mind you, but I was going to figure it out <laughs> because I really wanted to meet this like, Olympian. Yeah, I can do that. Sure. <laughs> of course. Um, so I, I showed up and I, I actually really just understood how the pieces worked immediately. And I got very involved in the men's gymnastics side of things and would go to many of their practices. And every day they were getting like STEM treatments, physical therapy. They had options for chiropractic. They had free access to their own mental health clinic that specialized in athletes' mental health. Um, I I had never 
seen anything like it. They had uh, doctors on speed dial that they could call that were just for the athletes. And I was like, wait wow. a second, men's gymnastics loses money for the university. And over here, my musician colleagues are like selling out full performances for, you know, musical theater and opera and this, that, and the other. And we don't have this type of access. Like there was a yoga right. class that was available for us. Um, there was a mindfulness class, but like we didn't have specific doctors and physical therapists available for us. And I was like, this is so wrong. <laughs> like this has to change. <laughs> and so I was really brought into this world and my eyes were opened to, Hey, you can have on-site medicine for musicians in this, in these formidable years where they need to learn how to prevent things and realize that like, they don't have to live through pain, that no pain, no gain thing. We don't, we don't agree with that anymore. <laughs> you can be free from pain and have a healthy practice life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so then you ended up getting your PhD. Congratulations on that. Thank by you. The way. Yeah. So exciting in performing arts health. So explain to me what is performing arts health? This sounds kind of new to me. Um, it is new, um, it, but it actually has roots and dates back to the 1700s uh, with this treatise from this man named Bernardino Ramazzini, and he was an occupational physician, and he saw, started seeing lute players uh, and lute woodworkers and then vocalists, and he started noticing that there were very specific problems related to this occupation. And so he started talking about these issues, but it was really forgotten about for a long, long time. And then in the 1980s here in the U.S., the Performing Arts Medical Association was formed. And then there were also uh, some in Britain and some in Germany. And now it's kind of expanded all over the world where these doctors got together and said, hey, we're noticing these problems too. We want to figure out you know, what is the prevalence rate? How often is this happening? How is it impacting musicians? How can we prevent it? And then as this began, began to gain more traction, the musicians themselves said, hey, we have, a, we have a voice. We have insight that you don't have. We should also be part of this community. And so um, one of those people uh, created this PhD program in performing arts health for musicians to have the vocabulary and learn how to conduct research on their own so that they can not just have anecdotal stories to tell, right. but also empirical research to deliver and make an impact on the scientific community. That's amazing. How did you find that program? Um, Round the world story, I the at the beginning of the podcast, I talked about how I had my solo debut with the Jacksonville Symphony Orchestra. The uh -huh. clarinetist at that time got a job in Atlanta, Marcy Gurno, and I was living in Atlanta and we had tea and she said, Hey, I just this came across on my Facebook today and I thought of you because of your story with stress velopharyngeal insufficiency, you should check it out. And so it was just really lots of moving pieces that came together where someone introduced it to me and said, I think you'd be a good fit for this. Well, yeah, it sounds like you're a perfect fit for it. And so you've, been doing, you. all this <laughs> you've been doing all of this research. Um, has there been anything really interesting or surprising to you as you've gone through your studies? There have been lots of things that have been surprising. And I think one of them uh, is called the biopsychosocial um, model, which talks okay. about the biological, social, and psychological factors that impact our health and the ways that we prevent injuries. So in one of the research studies that I conducted was specifically on clarinetists, because I am a clarinetist, so I was right. a little biased, um, <laughs> but... We found that a lot of men were unwilling to use neck straps. And if you sort of look around anecdotally, people feel like using neck straps for the clarinet is weak or it's not important. But we also know oh, that wow. clarinets, clarinet neck straps help alleviate um, the force pressure, pressure on your right thumb. And the people who use neck straps say that they perceive a difference in the pain in their right wrist 
by using the next job. So that's an example of a social factor, the peer pressure of, hey, this looks weak, impacting what actually could be a very effective preventative me- measure for clarinetist injuries. That kind of reminds me, kind of going back to that sports music connection, it kind of reminds me of when they did all the adjustments to the helmets and like the rules change, the, the rule changes mm-hmm. to football to try mm-hmm. to decrease injuries there and how there was some resistance to it at first because they thought it would be weak, but now people are playing better and more healthy and there's not nearly as many injuries. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting. We see it a lot in um, performance psychology. Like we know, like Simone Biles, so I'm pulling from my gymnastics world, but Simone (laughs) Biles has very vocally used a like performance and sports psychologist to Mm -hmm. help her and she's the most like successful gymnast of all time. Um, But still, even gymnasts in the U.S. will say, no, that's not for me. Like it may work for other people or they perceive it as being a weakness when really actually it's going to help you get better. So it's it's still prevalent across sports, across music. And so I've kind of wondered, well, what if clarinet makers like Bakun or Buffet or Selmer, what if they just started including neck straps in the case? Because, you know, you get your fake little ligature the, that's really not very good, but you use it for a long right. time. And what if it just right. came as part of your package and you started using it from the very beginning? Right, right. My daughter plays clarinet and it would, I think if it was in there in that first little, you know, high school or middle school case, she probably would have used it at the very beginning because she's always talking about how her thumb gets tired from playing too long. Yeah. So I would love to see more interventions happen from the like instrument creator perspective to come on board and say, hey, maybe we can adjust where we place the thumb rest so it's more ergonomically effective, or maybe we can Uh include neck straps or, you know, for other instruments too, they have their own problems and working with the manufacturers to say, okay, let's start this from the very beginning. Yeah. That's such a good idea. Is, is there a movement for that? Or is that kind of your idea that you're going to spearhead and (laughs) <laughs> um, hopefully it'll be my idea that I spearhead. I, I certainly <laughs> care more about musicians being healthy than someone taking my idea and running with it. So if someone listening to this podcast has connections in those way, please, by all means, like use them <laughs> too. But next job in the case of the musicians, and then let me know, and I'll start a study on it to see if it actually is effective. <laughs> I think it's a really great idea, though. I think that's fantastic. Um, so going along, I, well, with Simone Biles, her she really brought a lot of light into the mental health and performance because gymnastics really is a performing sort of sport as well, and there's an immense amount of pressure. When she took a hiatus, I guess, during the Olympics, or she couldn't compete because of a mental health, and she caught a lot of slack for that, but she also got a lot of respect from other performers and other um, athletes saying this is something that we need to pay attention to. Sure. And that's what a lot of people don't realize about what happened with Simone is that it wasn't just mental, but it was also physical. Um, Mm -hmm. And so she talks about something called the twisties, which means she was completely lost in the air and what her brain was telling her to do, her body physically could not do. It's um, a disconnect between the brain and the body. And it's something in the medical literature known as focal dystonia. And it's actually something that happens with musicians a lot, specifically with their embouchure. So Mm. they will want to form an embouchure, but they can't because it's shaking and it's not doing what your body is telling it to do. And so this idea that you can take time off and be successful and you can take time off and rest and maybe resting is actually the best thing to do for your team or for your orchestra is such an important point that I think we can pull from, from what Simone very, very bravely did into our own community. Um, But one of the impeding factors in that is that a lot of musicians are freelancers And they maybe don't have access to good insurance, or maybe they are living paycheck to paycheck. And if they miss a gig, then that may mean they're not eating. And so 
in concept, it's very easy, I think, for researchers to sit up and say, well, you should take time off and rest, or you should stop practicing as many hours, or you're going to need this time to uh, fix your hand posture, which takes a lot of time to undo, but it'll be best for your long term. When this person is thinking, I have to feed myself, or I have to feed my family, or I don't have the money to go to a doctor. And so these are other factors that we must address as as a community Mm -hmm. before just rattling off advice about taking time away from your profession. Right. The freelance, it really adds a level of stress to the profession as well, knowing that you are 100% in charge of, of like bringing in money that week. And if you miss a gig, then you just don't have any money for that week. And so that does cause a lot of musicians to work to the point that they physically can't work anymore. And then they get injured and then they're out. And there's a crazy statistic Um, From 2018, according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, 50 to 76 percent of professional musicians have reported sustaining musculoskeletal injuries. 50 to 76 percent. That's an insanely high figure for people to be. And for classical musicians, we we have evidence that it's even higher. I mean, the first large-scale study showed even up to 82%. Yeah. And the study on clarinetists that I just completed, it was 89.7%. Um, and it's not even just having sustained injuries, but one of the things that's coming up in this research idea is not only do you have an injury, but how impactful is it to your ability to practice and perform? And so that statistic, uh, it's from the fish fine study in the 1980s. It's the really the only and infer- the first large scale um, study on symphony and orchestra musicians. And 82% said, I have an injury. And 76% of those said it like severely affects my ability to practice and perform. Mm. That is so difficult. So not only does it affect them, physically affects them financially, especially if they're freelance, but then it also affects their mental health too. And I know that you've done a lot of research and it's a particular interest of yours, how injury affects mental health. What sort of things have you found in that area? Um, One of the things that I really dug into during my PhD and was part of our studies is something called musician's identity. And it's something taken from athletic research. So um, in the 1900s, oh gosh, that sounds so long ago. I feel like that sounds so old. You're making um, me feel so old right now. <laughs> um, so not too terribly long ago, but maybe 30 years ago. Yeah, just last century, <laughs> last millennia, right? Yeah. Jeez. There was um, something developed called the Athlete Identity Measurement Scale. And so there's, I think it's seven questions that you go through and it says, you know, I I identify as a musician. Most of my goals are related to, or sorry, being an athlete. Most of my goals are related to being an athlete. Most of my friends are part of athletics and so on and so forth. And they found that people with this really high number of identity and athletics actually really, really struggled in injury because where their identity was, they were no longer able to do the thing that they identified with. And so not too terribly long ago, maybe within the last 10 years, there's been this idea of creating the musician's identity measurement scale called the MIMS. And a couple different institutions have looked at that. There's one in England and there's uh, one here in the U.S. at the University of North Texas. And so they've started experimenting with this musician's identity measurement scale and looking at if musician's identity is highly correlated with depression and anxiety, especially during injury um, it hasn't been validated yet, but it, that is coming quickly soon down the down the pipeline. Um, and then with that, there, I don't know of any study pertaining to this, but anecdotally, I've heard several studies from musicians who said, you know, my parents were only proud of me when I did well in music, or my parents always introduced me as Sarah the flutist, or 
Johnny the trombonist. And so very early on, this identity is ingrained in you. So if you choose to stop for whatever reason, whether that's injury, you found a new passion, a part of you is sad or depressed or experiences anxiety because who other people associate you with is, or what people associate you with is no longer really a major part of your life. So it's just something to keep in mind, um, you know, as future parents, as current parents, as band directors, how we praise and give recognition to people. Is it only when they're doing well or when they accomplish something great? Or is it in the journey and being proud of them for learning something new and being brave and being being okay with failure because when you're learning something new, it's terrible at first. I mean, has anyone ever heard a beginning oboe player? Because that was me. I tried to learn the (laughs) oboe and it was awful and everyone knew it was bad and it was not the right instrument for me, but my parents (laughs) supported me through that journey. And then, you know, afterward they have of course mentioned, you know, like we were really glad when you didn't play the oboe anymore. (laughs) um, Yeah, I, I was really glad my my kids did not choose the oboe. But, you know, <laughs> it's beautiful once you've mastered it, but man, it is hard to get there. It absolutely it is. Hard to get there. Well, and so that's another thing, just kind of talking about supporting our students and our children at the beginning stages. Becoming a proficient musician is very difficult. And so how would you suggest that people balance that support, because I'm sure a lot of parents weren't meaning to only be, you know, complimenting their kids when they did well, or if they won a competition, or if they did well in an audition. I'm sure they didn't mean to, but how do we balance that? Okay, you need a lot of support because this is a really difficult thing, very very difficult skill that's going to take you a decade or more to really master. Um, Mm -hmm. How do we find that balance? The answer is there is no one size fits all answer and that every child and every person is individual and needs their own type of reassurance or they need to be left alone and they'll just show you something when they feel like it's finished and they don't want the weekly check-ins and that works well for them. And then some people want feedback every week and This is this is not re- this is not a research part. This is my personal opinion, just to make that clear. Um, <laughs> okay. I, I think a lot of that falls more on should fall more on the community. So maybe the private lesson teacher or the parent, rather than putting that on the classroom music educator, because the classroom music educator has enough things <laughs> to worry about. And they're, you know, like filling out this form and having to give grades and like someone went into t- detention and someone stuck cheese down the tuba. I'm like, you know, like it's like this <laughs> constant revolving thing. And so to be like, and now you're responsible for the individual happiness and support of each one of your hundreds of students, you know, feels. <laughs> That's a lot. That's a lot. It feels, it feels wrong, but it's, We're in the stage of musician's health research where awareness is doing a lot because people still are not aware that you don't have to push through the pain. They aren't aware that there are medical specialists who focus only on musicians. At the University of North Texas, we have two physicians who are there only for musicians. They know our instruments. They know our body. We can bring our instruments to them and they can look at, see how we're holding it. Um, and that's a privilege that that doesn't exist everywhere, but it does exist and it is becoming more prevalent. So I think just bringing that awareness of, Hey, be conscious of how you are complimenting your child or your musician, maybe also compliment them about how hard they practice this week or that, Mm -hmm. um, compliment them for continuing to work through this really hard section, even though maybe they're not getting any better, like, they're still working on it and we can talk about that and, and praise them for that. Yeah. Yeah. And teach them not to be afraid of failure. I think that's a big one too. Yes. Because resilience failure is inevitable in being a human being. (laughs) And being in a musician as well. There's a lot of failure in being a musician very much. So, so what are, um, 
So I know another aspect of your research is a health aware mindset. Now, is that kind of what we've been talking about? Or can you go into a little bit more detail about what a health aware mindset is? Sure. Um, so one thing that we see when or if musicians have the opportunity to go get medical care is they will say something like, I have pain. We're like, okay, where and what type of pain? And they, they, it just is like deer in the headlights. And we're like, okay, so is it numbness? Is it stabbing? Is it constant? Is it intermittent? Um, is it referred? So is it going down through your elbow? Is it throbbing? And having that vocabulary expedites the process for you getting a diagnosis and getting help. And also understanding the difference between growth, discomfort, and injury. Um, so to uh -huh. pull a reference from gymnastics, because that's my wheelhouse. So when you're learning to do a split, it's not comfortable, right? You're stretching <laughs> your body beyond its normal limits, unless you have some sort of hypermobility disorder, but it's not comfortable, but you're making progress versus if you are feeling a stabbing pain while you are in a split, something is wrong. Like if someone is pushing you down beyond where your body limits can accept it, they can tear muscle off of bone. It has happened. It happened to Olympians, um, all, all sorts of things. And so that's part of what I mean by creating this health aware mindset is having the vocabulary to be able to communicate with the professionals that can, can help you. And then two, knowing the difference between, okay, I, this is growth. This is a little bit of discomfort for me to get better. Like maybe you're pushing your embouchure into that fatigue area, but don't push it so far into the fatigue that you incur injury because the more you push that fatigue, the more likely you are to incur injury. Um, the other thing is when I talk about this um, health aware mindset, the National Association of Schools of Music, which is the accrediting body for all 600 plus schools of music in the U.S., requires all of them to teach on the basics of musculoskeletal, hearing, vocal health, and injury prevention. Now, if I was teaching a class, I would be like, now raise your hand if you got any of that in your school of music. And I guarantee you most of them would say no. There are some exceptions. Indiana's doing a great job. Michigan's doing a great job. Like there, there are definitely exceptions. But what most people are doing, most schools of music are doing, are sticking a PDF on their website with some basic information about musicians' health. And because oh. the National Association of Schools of Music hasn't said, okay, administrators are responsible for this or private studio teachers are responsible for this, no one knows who's responsible for it. So no one's take like, I shouldn't say no one, few people are taking responsibility and actually activating this in their school of music. So I have a consulting business. It's called the Musicians Health Lab. And I go into schools and I either help them integrate how to put this information into an existing class, or if they wanted to know how do we create a new class or how do we pull together the resources that are currently available in our university so that they can meet these mandates because posting a PDF on a website is not cutting it anymore. Like you may check that tick box for NASM, like NASM may say, okay, like this works for us. But if you actually care about impacting the musicians who are in your community and under your care, a PDF does not cut it. Wow. I didn't even realize that. But it sounds like things are changing a little bit. Things, it sounds like awareness is becoming more, more prevalent throughout school. So that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking about like music teachers associations. They're constantly having conferences and continuing education. I think these would be really important. I think it's an important topic for the teachers at that level. Like you said, the private teachers they need to know about this. I would say it's even more important actually than the, than at the collegiate level, because if you can start someone off in private lessons with the correct ergonomics, so that's like the study of your job setup. Um, mm -hmm. If you can set that up correctly from the very beginning, we probably would see a decrease 
in injuries over the long run because once someone's gotten to the collegiate level, they're some of their habits are pretty formed in yeah. place. And there are people who say, I, you know, with clarinet, they will see people tonguing, you know, in the middle of their tongue where they really should be using the tip and they get to college and they really do have to relearn it. And they do, but it's painful. It's possible to relearn hand position. It's, it's possible to learn to sit with proper posture for your instrument but it's really hard to redo. It takes a lot of time, a lot of resources, a lot of motivation. So if we can start that early, then there won't be as much need for people like me to come in at the collegiate level and say, okay, like damage control, what can we do now? (laughs) Well, I just, I love what you're doing. I'm so glad that you're helping. Um, I've had injuries as well. And I just, I didn't know the resources. I didn't, I'm sure my college had something like that. I'm sure they had information, but I just, I didn't see it. And, um, I just applaud you for the work that you're doing to raise awareness and to help these musicians have long and happy and healthy and successful careers. So thank you so much for doing that. Now, do you have any last minute advice for anyone who's wanting to become a musician and to, to how they do that healthy besides, I mean, you've been giving tons of advice already, but do you have any last parting words for us? I think so. a few things. One would be to listen to your body first and foremost. So if you feel something is wrong, it often is wrong. And that sounds very like woo woo to the scientific community because they're like, we want data. Mm-hmm. But in my practice as a life coach and listening to the stories of so many musicians, what I often hear them say is I knew something was wrong and I didn't know what to do about it, or someone else didn't believe me, or my teacher told me it was no big deal, and they ended up having worse injury because of it. Mm. Um, so that's that's one thing. Uh, the second thing I would tell them is there are resources available, um, and teach. I want to teach you like quickly, like here's how you can find them. So a lot of people funny as it sounds, are on Instagram. So there's a group called Yoga for All Musicians. So for people who are interested in using yoga for prevention, if you look up hashtags like Feldenkrais Method or Yoga for Musicians or uh, Pilates or Alexander Technique or Musicians Health even, Mm -hmm. there are people in that space who are working to take the scientific jargon and put it in understandable language for people who are on the front lines, the the music educators. And so if you don't already know about that, use that resource. Um, and then finally, if people are interested, I we can put my website in the yeah. show notes and people can reach out to me. I have a course coming this fall, which will teach anyone everything about the the research that there is now in very understandable language. Like I'm not going to throw words like epidemiology and population and sample and all of this nonsense at you. I'm going to say, here's how it applies to you in the language that you understand and the language that's comfortable to you. So you don't have to go through with a dictionary. Um, <laughs> and finally, I would say if you're okay with it, be vulnerable with your story because the statistics tell us that you aren't alone. Um, We know that 98% of people struggle with performance anxiety. Um, We know that, what is it, like 50% struggle with voice strength, specifically music educators. Um, We know that musicians are four times more likely to have hearing problems compared to the population. Mm -hmm. So you're probably not alone, and there's probably some social support around you that you can get if you're willing to be and able to be vulnerable in a safe way. Oh, that's fantastic. Wonderful advice. Thank you so much. So Dr. Kensley Beal, thank you. Thank you for coming and talking with me today and shedding light on this such important topic. I just so, I'm so grateful for you to talk with me today. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure.